Life Audio. Hey, welcome back to Gospel Rant Christmas Podcast 2022. This is our last one, number seven, the shamed priest Zechariah and the baby Jesus. So, hey, happy Christmas Eve. I mean, I hope you're not listening to this on Christmas Eve, sort of, because you should be doing something else. I mean, no judgment from me. But uh, hey, whenever you listen to this, welcome. What we're doing at Gospel Rant is we're taking up the challenge of shining new light on the Christmas story. I mean, the the old school children's pageants, I love them. But, you know, you can't go too deep in those things. And so we're going to dig deep. And it's a dialogue rant. We can be provocative. You can be free to disagree. We love that kind of feedback here. Bill at gospel-app.com. We encourage it. And please pass it on to other people. Um you know, shame priest is going to have some ramifications to a lot of people's lives. So welcome to the Gospel Rant and the Gospel Rant Christmas podcast. So isn't it interesting, no one got more coverage in the Christmas story than the shamed priest, Zachariah. I count 45 verses, and it's at the very beginning of the story, and it involves him and his wife, Elizabeth. And I'm telling you, 45 verses, that's a statement. No one got anywhere near that that many verses. But have you ever heard a sermon about him at Christmas or his role in the story? Well, I think you'll enjoy this. And again, pass it on to friends and church and pastors, missionaries. There's lots of shamed priests out there. And this is such good news. Okay, before we get into it, this is a great time for a word from our sponsors. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Bonnie Curry, one of the narrators on the Abide app, a premium ad-free biblical meditation experience. Join the millions of people who download the Abide app to reduce stress, improve sleep, and experience the peace of God every day. You can text the word PEACE to 22433 for a seven-day free trial of Abide. Just text PEACE to 22433, and you'll likely hear from me again on the app as I guide you through daily meditations or help you fall asleep and experience the peace of God. Hi, I'm James Seawood, one of the narrators on the Abide app, a premium ad-free biblical meditation experience. Join the millions of people who download the Abide app to reduce stress, improve sleep, and experience the peace of God every day. You can text the word PEACE to 22433 for a seven-day free trial of Abide. Just text PEACE to 22433, and you'll likely hear from me again on the app as I guide you through daily meditations or help you fall asleep and experience the peace of God. Hey, welcome back. So here's the largely overlooked and misunderstood story about the shamed priest, Zechariah, and I'll make comments along the way. Luke 1.5. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abiha. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were upright in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly. I'll say something about that, verse 7. But they had no children because Elizabeth was barren and they were both well along in years. Once, when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as a priest before God, he was chosen by lot. And remember, there's no such thing as coincidence. He was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. That's Luke 1, 5 to 9. All right, a little background. In those days, the priesthood in Jerusalem, those who served the temple, they were divided into 24 groups with uh, four to nine families in each. It's historical, it's legacy. And these were the regular priesthood, not the powerful, wealthy, elite Sadducean high priest who had become wealthy as supporters of the former rulers, the Hasmoneans. So in those days, the, the regular blue-collar priest, if you will, They did their jobs faithfully and quietly. It was a legacy of God, but we believe that they typically struggled financially. They weren't supposed to own property, Uh, but by the way, uh, that was largely tossed out during the Hasmonean kingdoms for the elite, the high priest. 
we we uh, we've dug up a luxurious home near the temple of a high priest, and you have exclusive ramps to go into the temple so that they would not be made impure by touching other Jews. Oh my goodness! You can sense the arrogance, the self righteousness among the detachment among the elite Sadducean upper tier. So when Luke says that Zeke was righteous. I assume that he's saying, among other things, that he was not one of the corrupt, wealthy, politically emplaced elites. Okay, so so many of the regular Levites, like Zechariah, like I said, they struggled to make ends meet during those days, but they did it. It was a calling, it was a sacrifice. By the way, many pastors and missionaries do that. Zeke did it right, according to the Bible. So in addition to serving at the three great annual festivals, the Levites, the priests, would be allotted two separate weeks each year for additional service. And get this, Zechariah, his name means God remembers, and he was of the eighth division of Abiah, which means Yahweh is father. I love the choice of names in the story. So God remembers, Yahweh is father. Oh my goodness, there could be another podcast just about that. So the Luke narrative recognizes the piety of both husband and wife. Aaron was a priest in good standing, and the narrative rhetoric, it just means basically that. It doesn't mean that he was a superhuman saint. It doesn't mean he was sinless. Only Jesus is sinless. No, he was a priest, fully ordained, without stain or blemish on his official record. He knew the law. He was familiar with all of the additional regulations of service and piety, and he did them intentionally to the very best of his ability. And the same could be said of Elizabeth. She was of the tribe of Aaron, and so this this uh, Zeke Elizabeth marriage was blessed according to regulations and custom. Priests were to marry virgin Israelites, but it's an even bigger gig to marry virgin daughters of the priestly line. That's that's a bonus. So on this day, this Advent, Aaron was chosen by Lot out of the 18,000 other priests who ministered at the temple in Jerusalem to take on the responsibility of ministering at the altar of incense that's inside the holies. Here we go. Twice a day before the daily morning offerings and after evening offerings on the huge altar out front of the holies, a single priest would go into the sanctuary, into the holies, and burn incense. Look, This activity was highly regulated and defined. You're not messing around. You're you're not winging it. Zechariah would have been schooled exactly what to do, to say, in order, and to do it correctly without error. I mean, today you might want to think of a a high church ritual with with robes and reading strict uh, from from the prayer book without any error, right? That's the idea. Okay, the altar of incense was immediately in front of, so it was in the holies and immediately in front of the curtains that separated the holies from the holy of holies. You've heard of that, right? In the older times, pre-exile, the holy of holies, again, only feet from where Zechariah was that day, the holy of holies would have contained the Ark of Covenant with the two gold-clad wings of the seraphim unfurled over the mercy seat. And Zeke would never go inside the thick curtains that separated the Holy of Holies from the so-called holy place, because that's for the high priest alone. And remember, the high priest in that day and time, during Zach's lifetime, you needed high friends. It was a purchased position, uh, either power or money. And Herod himself appointed high priest at times. So inside the ark, pre-exile, so this is centuries earlier, inside the ark was the tablet of the law, Aaron's rod, but most importantly, inside the Holy of Holies, God's presence, his Shekinah glory dwelt there. Don't have a good word, mysteriously and powerfully, God's presence was there. I mean, he's omnipresent, but pre-exile in the temple God's presence was powerfully there, okay? But not now, not during Zeke's lifetime. And every priest, no doubt, knew it. Zechariah knew it. They would have known that the Holy of Holies, at that point in time, was barren, empty, uh, a, a closet, an empty closet. God's presence, 
you know, the presence of God that they had known and, and identified with as Israel did not return with the people from exile some half a millennia before this. So the plot thickens. And so nevertheless, the faithful priest did their thing as instructed by law and regulation. And matter of fact, in the writings, we, we know that they were taught on the Day of Atonement, which happened once a year, even though it was empty back there, the high priest would go in and service the Ark of the Covenant as if it were there. You fake it. It's tragic. I mean, you can hear and feel the shame or maybe even the fear. I mean, it's my guess that the average Jew, Joe and Mary on the street, weren't even aware of the absence of the presence of God. I mean, I can imagine that the Sadducean elites, the high priest and his family would have been afraid to get that info out there because it might affect a lot of things. It might affect participation at the temple, offerings. Uh, it might even spin off more Essene movements, uh, maybe crush the already beat up hope of the average Jew, right? So uh, it's covered up. If, if they were to find out that God's presence, his powerful presence wasn't with them like it was earlier, whew. All right. Now, I want to highlight verse 7. Zeke and Elizabeth had no children, and we're given the reason why. We're told that they're old beyond childbearing years, but also Elizabeth was barren, stiera. Now, to be barren in that culture had uh, not only physical, social, but also spiritual implications, way beyond medical. To not have children in that day and culture implied that God was not happy with you. That's the implication. Children are a blessing from the Lord. It's all through the Old Testament. So therefore, if you don't have children, the suspicion was you're not being blessed, you're being right cursed. So you or your spouse must have done something wrong or not done something right that made God withhold such an important blessing from you. And listen, if you were a righteous priest in good standing and a righteous spouse, in, in, you, would, you would expect blessings, right? I mean, think of the optics. If God won't bless Zechariah and Elizabeth, then who would ever get on God's good side? It's a horrible optic for the entire priesthood. So I'm going to guess that Zechariah's presence in the temple, and particularly when he gets inside the holies, was a, left an, ah, an open, unaddressed question out there. Probably someone asked a well-meaning, probably insensitive question. So, Zechariah, have you tried offerings recently? You know, sin offerings or, or do another offering for an unknown sin that was prescribed in the law. Or, or, Zechariah, come on now. It's time to confess and be honest. Uh, is it Liz? Is it you? Oh, my goodness. But then God does what God does. <laughs> he moves towards you know, those people who feel unfavored. This, he, he picks sinner boy to go inside the holy place. I mean, can you imagine what the other priests would have thought? Like, really? And why? So they could have a private one-on-one -on -one with an angel. <laughs> the shamed priest, uh, the one who was likely doing his job faithfully, even though he was the butt of rumors and maybe jokes, he was about to have his shame removed, but it's going to be a painful operation. And by the way, is it one of the ironies of the story? Let me tie a couple of thoughts together. Elizabeth wasn't the only barren one in the story, right? The entire Holy of Holies was barren. In fact, Israel was barren. But all of those situations are going to be changed. First, Elizabeth is going to have a child. And then Mary is going to have a child. And Mary will become a type of Holy of Holies because in her womb... In that empty space, the presence of God will enter. Cool, right? Again, we could do more podcasts on that, but back to the story. Luke one ten, And when the time for burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to Zechariah, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. Verse 12. When Zechariah saw him, he was troubled. The Greek word is terasso. Pretty strong, disturbed, upset, terrified, frightened, stirred up. You can translate it in any of those ways. Seeing and fear, phobos, where we get phobia, fell upon him. Epipto, which is could mean pressing really close. You're feeling claustrophobic, embraced. So it, it viscerably, his fear 
started strangling him. Great, great imagery. So I, I'll ask the obvious question. He's in the temple. He's praying for God's return, for God to give him a sign, for God to speak, for God's presence to come back, right? And he does, well, at least an emissary. So why isn't he grateful? Why isn't he, isn't he dancing? Like Tevia, right? Um, why not joy? It, because remember, the prayers were requesting that God return and bless his people. So why not? Well, come on, let's not get over religious. I get it. It's a shock. Angels, scary, huge, powerful, likely armed, uh, and they haven't been seen in a half a millennia. So even a person of faith like a priest eh, probably got a little cynical and, um, you know, maybe didn't expect much. Been doing this for a while, his entire life. He was an old man. I get it. But I also guess, just speculating, that there was some fear of judgment too. You know, maybe it's time to pay the piper, whatever I did that caused me to not be blessed with children, it's time. Right? That's the open question, I think, in, in Zach's, the shamed priest's head. Okay? Now, having said that, taking Zechariah out, I have observed uh, personally and, and in other religious places that this kind of fear, um, fear of God coming, is actually common to the successfully religious. I mean, those who kind of pull it off, the upright and blameness of all times and places, the religious. And here's why. They're committed to doing right, right? Uh, in, in order to fav uh, gain God's favor. But their secret fear, humanly, no judgment, is that they know at a deep level that they haven't done it perfectly. Nobody has. Only Jesus did. So... They might be more righteous and godlike than me, but oh, come on, that's a low bar. They haven't done enough, whatever that means, to earn some favor of a perfectionistic God. And believe me, God is perfectionistic. Every religious person knows that to be upright ultimately means to be perfectly upright. And the dirty little secret is that no one is. No one righteous, no, not one. The Bible says so in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Sorry. Well, the righteous... Those folks, men and women who work so hard at this, obsessed with it, I've noticed that they have a discernible hair trigger. It's a stress. And, in, and when that trigger's pulled, so when they're caught, when they fall short, when they get exposed, when they get criticized, and not necessarily a huge moral failure, but even in the bright light that shows that they weren't as good as they thought, man, what triggers, what, what pops up is fear. Fear of judgment, fear of being seen as a failure, fear of loss of reputation, fear of identity. And it's followed by a rush of shame and guilt, defensive mechanisms, excuses, blame shifting, comparisons, lies, offensiveness, self-righteousness, externalizing, blaming other people, blaming the sun, accusing, demanding questions, right? Uh, if you, By the way, push back, Bill, at gospel-app.com or, or write me some stories. All right, let's see what, Z what Zeke does. Verse 13. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to name him John. Hold on to that. That's really interesting. He will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. All right, something Zechariah has never been able to pull off. He's never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from birth. I'll come back to that too. Many of the people in Israel will he bring back to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah asked the angel... He, he drops the ball. How can I be sure of this? I get it. I'm an old man and my wife is well along in years. Believe me, no judgment. No matter what I would have said at that moment in time, I would have been thinking this too. Listen, the angel gives this shamed priest, this righteous man filled with fear. First of all, the angel says, don't be afraid, but that never works. And he says this, God's good news is not about judgment, all right? Um, 
or any kind of measurement of all of Zeke's uprightness. So it's not about punishing Zeke. That's not, that's not why God came. God has come to bless he and his wife with a son. Check. And in fact, a great son, a prophetic son, a prophet. Why? Well, we're only told that God has seen fit to answer Zeke's prayer in a stunning, unimaginable way. See, this would be equivalent to the angel saying to Mary, the favor of the Lord is upon you. The sign of God's favor, of course, is that Elizabeth would be pregnant. And by the way, very interesting promise made to a priest. Uh, John will be an agent to bring people back to the Lord their God. Now think about that. The implications are, of course, that what Zeke was doing in the temple wasn't pulling that off. The, the temple rituals wasn't working. The people weren't being brought back to the Lord their God. So the, God's bringing a plan B, if you will. Of course, all plans are plan A's with God, but you know what I mean. The temple where Zeke is dedicated all of his religious effort has fallen flat. John, on the other hand, is going to make ready a people. God is going to use John. Not the law of first century Judaism. That didn't work either. It's a great implied backstory. Well, one of the problems with liturgy is the temptation that it could become dead and rote. The mind can just shut down. It can, can just become words. If you're following the Sermon on the Mount podcast, we just talked about prayer and the Lord's Prayer, and, and, and boy, that has happened a lot with the Lord's Prayer. So I wonder if any of the priests in the darkness of that time in Israel really thought that God would ever answer any of their prayers, or were they just doing their job? Cynicism. Uh, it might have taken long, over long before, and no ju judgment, not for me, it happens all the time. So back to Zeke. So his prayer answered, his shame removed, his shame of not having a son. So he wasn't under a curse after all. The angel answers all of his prayers, spoken and unspoken, and now, now he dances. Now, nah, not, not Zeke. <laughs> this upright man who's done everything right. Fear, fight or flight, overwhelming him, and then he says something stupid. <laughs> what a shocking response when God, God's favor actually comes. So give me favor, give me favor, give me favor. Okay, here's favor. Boom. I'm not going to believe it unless I get proof. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, and such, such was the state of Israel. And look, honestly, such is the state of the church in so many places today. Let's, let's face it. Uh, here at Gospel App, we want to be honest. Push back, Bill, at gospel-app.com. So, no humility bubbles up out of Zeke, no submission, no as you wish. I mean, we do see that with Mary, right? But not Zeke. What we see is fear and shame. What other sign did he need other than the word of an angel, right? I mean, to be reasonable or a pregnant wife. So his outburst was absurd. No meekness there. Uh, his heart betrays him. It's not a faithful heart right? Um, fear and fear's evil stepsister, unbelief. Well, I did a little research. Uh, this is a modern synagogue prayer, but it might reflect some of the things that Zeke might have been rotely saying as he burned the incense right in front of the Holy of Holies, and he would have had it memorized. He would have been able to do it in his sleep. He's probably done it before. Here we go. You are holy, your name is holy, and holy brings beings praise you daily for all eternity. Blessed are you, Lord, the holy God. You graciously bestow knowledge upon man and teach mortals understanding. Graciously bestow upon us from you wisdom and understanding and knowledge. Blessed are you, Lord, who graciously bestows knowledge. Cause us to return, our Father, to your Torah. Draw us near, our King, to your service, and bring us back to you in wholehearted repentance. Blessed are you, Lord, who desires penitence. Pardon us, our Father, for we have sinned. Forgive us, our King, for we have transgressed, for you are good and forgiving God. Blessed are you, Lord, gracious one who pardons abundantly. O oh, behold our affliction and wage our battle. Redeem us speedily for the sake of your name. For you, God, are a mighty redeemer. Blessed are you, Lord, redeemer of Israel. Yeah. I mean, okay, so, yeah. 
All, all good prayers, right? But, right? See, I wonder if we could, like God does, hear Zeke's inner voice as he's saying those prayers or prayers like them. His heart might have been saying, his critical inner voice might have been saying, wow, do you know, truth were known. God, I prefer you stay at a distance, kind of theoretical. Uh, you know, if, if you come close, it's going to make me feel less right and guilt and shame. And, and look, there's other people. Why me? Why am I being, why would I be set up to fail? What if, what if I believe the angel and I go out there and tell people and it doesn't happen? I, I couldn't take the shame. I've been living into shame. I, what My reputation. And by the way, it seems that the angel is undermining my career too. This could have serious repercussions. Will I be required to follow my son? Do I have to leave my job? Is, is it all about the destruction of the temple? What about all my training? I mean, I worked real hard to get at this level, and I do it right. I am upright. Everybody, my supervisor says so. Right? <sighs> Verse 19. The angel answered, I'm Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. I mean, I imagine he said it boldly. And I've been sent to speak to you and tell you this good news. And now you'll be silent, not able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their proper time. Ouch. By the way, once again implied, the angel stands in the presence of God, not Zechariah in the temple, right? So Gabriel stands in the presence of God. Zechariah doesn't. The dirty little secret acknowledged by God's ambassador. So, Zeke, since you're afraid to submit due to fear, you're clearly not the one to risk your reputation by being my mouthpiece for something this outlandish, the successful, hardworking, religious man or woman won't do. They're way too concerned with how they appear to others. Nope. I'm going to find people who aren't as afraid of losing their reputation. Let me think. Oh, yeah, the shepherds. And I'm going to find another to be my priest. Since you chose not to be my mouthpiece, you will be mute. Incredible irony. Great story. The religious people, the successfully right, were temporarily disqualified from participation in God's return due to fear and unbelief. So this is, this is the pinnacle of righteous man, and he... Uh, right underneath, he struggles with fear, crippling fear and unbelief. Indirectly, it's due to their self-righteousness. I mean, if you look at your life this morning and see no outlandish kingdom miracles around you, it may not be, be because of your unrighteousness. It might be because of your righteousness. So there was no corporal punishment for his lack of faith, right? He wasn't killed, but there was shame and maybe even worse for a righteous person who, is, who might be so concerned that others see them as right, the privilege of being the priest of this new kingdom is going to pass from the temple priesthood and fall upon shepherds, Gentiles, and unwed mothers. That's a Merry Christmas thing there. All right, this is probably a good time to pause and get another word from our sponsor. We will be right back. Our world can feel chaotic and uncertain. But we don't have to live enslaved to fear. Christ has promised you and I his peace, and throughout scripture, he has provided powerful truths and practical steps to help us experience greater freedom. I'm Jennifer Slattery, lead host of the Faith Over Fear podcast, inviting you to join me and my team as together we learn how to starve our fears and grow our faith. Subscribe at lifeaudio.com. Finding uplifting news in today's headlines is often like searching for a needle in a haystack. At the Story Behind podcast, we believe in the power of finding heartwarming tales and are happy to share empowering stories with you every week. Get inspired by the note a waitress received from a patron dining alone. And even hear about how one VIP passenger made a hardworking pilot get emotional before his flight. To start listening to the Story Behind podcast, visit lifeaudio.com. Hey, welcome back. <clears throat> Luke one twenty one. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. 
When his time of service was completed, he returned home. After after this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. Just a little side note. Again and again and again, Old and New Testament, I did a series on this once, maybe I'll do it again. It seems like women are a lot more sensitive to God's favor. When the when the angel comes and says you're blessed, it's 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 certainly much more typical for a woman to go, Oh, thank you. I'm blessed for men. Uh it's much, much, much harder. And it certainly was in this case. Elizabeth gets it. I'm gonna skip to verse fifty seven. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, no, he is to be called John. They said to her, there's no one among your relatives who has that name. Then they made signs to his father to find out What he would like to name the child, he asked for a writing tablet, and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, his name is John. Immediately, his mouth was opened and his tongue was loosed, and he began to speak, praising God. The neighbors were filled with awe, and throughout the whole country of Judea, people were talking about all these things. Everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, when then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. All right, speculation, but this is fun. John was not a family name. It's not a typical uh, Levite name from the tribe of Aaron. Interestingly, though, it was a common name for the former Hasmoneans. Uh, they were the, the bunch that, that ruled Israel before Herod. Uh, they were perennially enemies of Herod. So I'm just, uh, speculation is God tugging on Herod's beard here. Is This evangelist is going to be named like a Hasmonean <laughs> or... You know, maybe we're going to get this notion that that this new John is going to be a new kind of revolutionary, like the Hasmoneans were at the beginning of their rule, that are going to be part of a new Jewish kingdom, uh, like the Hasmoneans. Interesting to speculate. Verse 67, his father Zechariah was filled with the Spirit and prophesied. The kingdom has arrived. Think back uh, biblically to the last time before Zechariah that anyone was recorded as being filled with the Spirit. I mean, a long time ago, there were some judges, a king or two, Ezekiel. But that's, that's five centuries before. And now Elizabeth is filled and pregnant. John has prophesied to be filled and maybe Mary, also pregnant. And now the shamed priest, Zechariah. And filled with the Spirit, he says, praise be to the Lord. And I bet he said it differently than his, than his work in the temple that day. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come and has redeemed his people. Now, it's prophetic grammar. It's uh, God has come. It's past tense, aorist middle, God came and made redemption, past tense. And prophets are given amazing ability and freedom to say what will happen in the future as if it happened already. So Jesus isn't even born yet. He's in Mary's womb. He's Israel's redeemer. The true king of the Jews is here. So prophetically, Zechariah says, go ahead and put it in the book. Israel is redeemed. Verse 69, he has, God has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of a servant David, as he said through his holy prophets of long ago, salvation from our enemies and from the land hand of all who hate us to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham to rescue us from the hands of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear and holiness and righteousness before him all our days. Boy, poignant. And now Zechariah, Zeke can serve and minister without fear because he's redeemed and his childless childless curse is lifted. Zechariah is changed. 76, and you, my child, speaking to John, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people a knowledge of salvation through forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven 
to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he lived in the desert until he appeared publicly to Israel. All right. And so implication, perhaps, um, Zechariah wasn't filled with the Spirit while he was serving in the temple, but now that he is, we see a whole different guy. He's humble. He's confident. And this is what fears God, I think, looks like, that that uh, amalgam, fearing God. Uh, it doesn't mean like you're trembling. It actually, you're, you're in this space where you're, you're believing, you're Spirit-filled. He's grateful. And his posture is love, not fear. He doesn't look like an at-risk child anymore. The prayer is riddled not with his uprightness and his service, sacrifice as a faithful priest. It's, the prayer is riddled with what God does. God redeems his people, his unfaithful people. He raises up a savior, not Zeke or the high priest. God rescues them because they need a rescuer. He shows mercy. He remembers Zechariah's very name, and he remembers his unilateral promise to Abraham long before the law, long before they were priests. And check this last part out, and maybe Zechariah did a belly laugh. God has enabled, he said, us to serve him without fear. <laughs> that's, that's it. So what are you afraid of this, this Christmas Eve? Ah, the Christ child, the beginning of the end of fear and shame, apart from the law, but yet through the law. Uh, it's an amazing story. Uh, the, the people who came to see the Christ child, the changes in their life and their demeanor and their understanding of who they were and who he is. Oh, my goodness. So important. All right. It's a long podcast. I need to end it. I want to take just a second to thank the team at Life Audio for their partnership with us. Go to lifeaudio.com and you can find many other podcasts. If you enjoyed our 2022 Christmas series, check out the ongoing series, The Sermon on the Mount. It should be finished towards the end of January, beginning of February, but you can go back and listen to it from the very beginning. I published a workbook on the Beatitudes called Jesus Said What? Question mark. You can listen to it at uh, Right Now Media. You can get the workbook from Amazon. Um, and by the way, hopefully, God willing, we'll do a Christmas uh, workbook for adults sometime next year. We should have that uh, hopefully ready in, in uh, July sometime, so you can use it during the Christmas season next year. I would also invite you to go to our website, gospel-app.com. Check it out. We've got a lot of stuff there. Uh, there's, there's, there's stuff you can get, there's stuff that's free. And by the way, speaking of free, we just published this year an online video program for frustrated Christian parents of teens and tweens. It's called goodenoughparent.online. Goodenoughparent, one word, on, dot online. Great feedback from parents and counselors so far. Have you wondered why your teen blows up at the table when you make them eat their broccoli? Well, there's two subconscious questions that every adolescent's brain is asking. Don't you want to know what they are? They, don't, they likely don't even know it. Remember, goodenoughparent.online, totally free. Generous funding donors have, have funded that and said, get it out there as quickly as possible. Hey, listen, uh, Merry Christmas from Gospel App Ministries and, and myself. Until the next podcast, take heart, child of God. Hi, I'm James Seawood, one of the narrators on the Abide app, a premium ad-free biblical meditation experience. Join the millions of people who download the Abide app to reduce stress, improve sleep, and experience the peace of God every day. You can text the word PEACE to 22433 for a seven-day free trial of Abide. Just text PEACE to 22433, and you'll likely hear from me again on the app as I guide you through daily meditations or help you fall asleep and experience the peace of God. Hi, I'm Bonnie Curry, one of the narrators on the Abide app, a premium ad-free biblical meditation experience. Join the millions of people who download the Abide app to reduce stress, improve sleep, and experience the peace of God every day. You can text the word PEACE to 22433 for a seven-day free trial of Abide. Just text PEACE to 22433, and you'll likely hear from me again on the app as I guide you through daily meditations or help you fall asleep and experience the peace of God.